Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Patrice James, and welcome to uh, the ABA's Criminal Justice Section's Fall Institute and our discussion on Second Look and de incarceration. We are really excited and happy that you have joined us for this conversation. Um, first, uh, the panelists will introduce themselves, um, and then we'll get into a panel discussion uh, about second look opportunities for justice for incarcerated people um, and de-incarceration. Uh, I'll begin uh, with David Singleton, if you can introduce yourself. Thanks. Good evening. Um, my name is David Singleton. I'm the executive director of the Ohio Justice and Policy Center based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I'm also one of the center's lawyers. We are a nonprofit public interest law firm that, uh, among other things, works to decarcerate uh, our state prison system. And we have a new project that I'll be talking about through uh, during my presentation or, I guess, in response to questions called Beyond Guilt, which uh, the focus of which is to uh, find release mechanisms for people who have uh, been convicted of serious crimes, have uh, demonstrated rehabilitation and serve a significant portion of um, their sentence. And we've gotten a number of people out so far, and I'm eager to talk more about that. Mary? Thank you so much for having me uh, on this panel, and I'm really excited to hear, David, about your project. Um, I'm Mary Price. I'm the general counsel of FAM. We used to be called Families Against Mandatory Minimums, but we broadened our brief in the last number of years. Um, I've been there. This will be, I'm starting my 21st year at FAM, so um, I know a little bit about what the work that we're doing. But we are a sentencing and criminal justice reform organization, and we are were founded by and um, serve, and our membership is, uh, for the most part, people who are incarcerated and their loved ones. Um, I have uh, worked on a lot of things over the years, but of late have worked a lot on Second Look, and particularly with respect to compassionate release at the federal level and also at the state level. Um, prior to that, I did a lot of work on clemency uh, along with the ABA, uh, side by side, and I like to think sometimes that my day job is getting people out of prison, so um, it's, it's good work to do. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. And finally, uh, Norman. Hi, good evening. My name is Norman Brown. I, I, am, I'm a, I'm a, I work for the Department of Youth and Rehabilitative Services here in uh, Washington, D.C., I'm the program manager of an initiative called The Credible Messenger. Uh, we work directly with at-risk youth. Um, we do a lot with them. We try to help guide them on to, uh, to a path that will lead them away from the pipeline to prison. We work with them from everything to trying to get their lives on track, dealing with school, avoiding violence, all of the things that young people seem to be getting themselves involved in we try to make sure that we help save them from going down the path that people like myself went down and spent a very long time in prison. And now we're out to try to prevent them from doing the same thing. So thank you for having me on. And I look forward to having a wonderful moment with you uh, discussing some of these issues. Thank you, Norman. And thank you so much to our panelists for joining us. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as a result of the uprisings over the summer, there has been a lot of focus on police reform, but not quite as much focus on uh, reforming the entire system, so the criminal legal system. Why is it also important to focus on the larger system, but in particular people uh, who are incarcerated? Well, I'm happy to to, to go, just focusing on policing ignores people who are, in many cases, the subjects of the very racism in the system that we deplore. That uh, is a lot of the reason why people are out on the streets. And it is easy to for people to ignore 
folks who are locked away. And it's, 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 it's unfortunate that we write people off when they go to prison. If we are serious about addressing mass incarceration in our country, we are going to have to figure out how to get people released and not just people who have committed low level nonviolent crimes. Whenever I hear politicians talk about that as the solution to mass incarceration, that's not going to get us anywhere. It's not going to get us anywhere because at least in the state prison system, most people who are locked up and serving long sentences are there for, for doing something that's more serious than a lower level offense. So we have to, if we care about um, eliminating racism in the criminal legal system um, as a whole, we can't ignore what's happening in our prisons, which are disproportionately filled with people of color. So you can't just address policing and then think we have addressed the problems in the criminal legal system without looking at mass incarceration and actually getting people out who've been overpunished for serious crimes. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think that it's absolutely critical that we um, be able to deal with what I think is a human legacy of a very broken system. I mean, our justice system has been addicted to incarceration as a means of managing problems. Um, and that addiction is fed by, I think, a really steady supply of people who are over-policed, over-prosecuted, and over sentenced and, and, I, and I think the choices that police agencies make about where to concentrate resources, whom to arrest, uh, what to arrest them for has a great deal to do with who we incarcerate, um, for what and for, for, for how long. Um, we certainly see that in the federal system, and I think you make a very good point, David, with respect to the state system. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to achieve justice in this system until we not only reform the police and practices, but we also ensure that the legacy of over-policing, uh, you know, in the, in the form of people serving sentences that are way out of proportion to their conduct, um, and also people who are who are thrown away because of the nature of the offense um, or of their conviction is also addressed and, and corrected. And and just to add to uh, what was said before, I totally agree. And being a person that was incarcerated for a long period of time, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the crack versus cocaine uh, epidemic, and to and to realize that I constantly have uh, friends and, and 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 people that are still incarcerated from that very same era. If we if we forget about the talents that are inside of those prisons that are rotting away, um, because uh, what it end up happening is that even myself, when I was there, and President Obama had uh, changed the crack versus cocaine from 100 to one down to 18 to one, uh, there were recipients such as myself who did not qualify to receive a law that had been made, that had, that had changed, but wasn't made retroactive. So what ends up happening is that you have those of us, if it doesn't be for clemency that I received from President Obama in 2015, I would still be incarcerated because I had three life sentences for a nonviolent crime offense. So what happens if we forget about them, we forget about some of the very same answers to some of the things that are going on within our community. There are, there are men and women that are in there that can come out of there with their experiences, with the talents that they have acquired while they were in there. They are changed people. But I always remember that if you have a fruit that stays past right, the next stage of that piece of fruit is rotten. And what happens is that the longer they stay in, the more we forget about them, the rotten they become. And then when they come out full of vengeance and, and, and frustration and anger due to a system that has kept them far beyond their time, then we want to blame the people rather than blaming the system. And I don't think that's fair. One of the 
things I, I hear um, often, um, and David, you, you mentioned this, um, uh, that a lot of people who are serving long sentences are, are, are not there, in fact, for um, nonviolent offenses, drugs, um, uh, property crimes, that it's more serious, serious offenses, offenses where there's often um, a victim. And I'm wondering um, how, what is the role of victims in, in, in your work? Um, and are you able to engage to them? What do you, how, do, how do they? So we've gotten about 25 people out for serious crimes in the year and a half that the project's been going. Um, and in some of those cases, um, and, and, and the ones I'm talking about where we've worked with the uh, victim's family have been cases where somebody, you know, was killed um, and our client was convicted of murder. And in the cases where we've been able to engineer ways to get back into court, because we don't have a second look statute yet um, in, in the state of Ohio uh, for life sentences, we don't. Um, we we've had some success in getting the family members of, uh, of, of victims to be supportive, which has been really helpful in getting the prosecutor's office to be supportive. And so we've reached out to, 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 to victims' family members. We've had um, respectful, but, you know, it's uncomfortable uh, conversations because you, you know that they're in pain and they, they have lost uh, something when, they, when, when a loved one was killed. But um, you'd be surprised at how um, there's more uh, receptiveness than you think um, would exist from the family members of someone who's been, been killed in terms of um, seeing the person who was responsible get released, provided that they have you know, served a significant sentence and have demonstrated rehabilitation. The only point I want to make about the involvement of victims is that we're very careful that that should not be determinative in terms of whether someone who has been overpunished should be released. I mean, where we have the support of, of, of victims, family members, great. Or if it's not a murder case, the victim themselves, great. But where they don't support, that doesn't mean that the person we represent should just stay locked up. And I, I love that point that, that Norman made about um, fruit. And, you, you know, you, you, it, people, when they, when they just are warehoused, they're, I don't want to say they rot um, because I, they're still good people, but it's just, it's, it's rot in terms of the opportunity that they could come out and be productive now. And, and that lost opportunity is right. And we can't let um, victims, families, or the victims themselves in cases be the veto over where, whether someone gets released. So, yes, if they're on board, we work with them. If they're not, we respectfully disagree and we push on to get the person that we're representing out. <clears throat> You know, I, I think that that's super important. And I, what you make me think about in talking about that in terms of second look legislation or laws or abilities is, you know, we, we're having going through this grand experiment in the federal system right now with compassionate release. And, you know, we didn't know if it could be used, the new law could be used to get people who are vulnerable to COVID out. And it turns out that that was, it was elastic enough to do that. Uh, and now we're beginning to push the boundaries out even farther and trying to see if we can use compassionate release for things that were never traditionally considered for compassionate release, including going back and rescuing people who've been left behind by reforms that were made prospectively, but not made retroactive, Norman was um, referring to earlier. Um, but one of the things that um, really strikes me about the federal system, and I've, I've done some work on looking at all the state compassionate release or, you know, quasi-second look, uh, statutes, but one of the things that makes is a real standout in the federal system is there are no exclusions. There's no, um, uh, uh, there's nothing that says you can't get this consideration. The judge can't release you if you've committed X crime. 
if you've been, forgive me, convicted of X crime. And so, and when I look across the states, that is not the case at all. And I'm forgetting Ohio for the moment, and forgive me, you'll know better than I, but there's probably a number of exclusions and plus that system is very badly broken. But, but as we go forward and think about advocacy, I think one of the most difficult challenges we're gonna have is pushing back because every time we see one of these proposals, all of a sudden, just saw it in Virginia, all of a sudden lots and lots of exclusions, not for this person, not for this crime, not for this, victims have, you know, and so forth. And so I don't know that, <laughs> it's, a, it's a dilemma and a challenge. And of course it's a good one. We can't just get people out one at a time. We've got to reform systems so we can get more people out. But, but, um, but yeah, that's what you've um, reminded me that that's a feature that we've somehow managed to preserve in our, our quasi second look compassionate release system. I know Norman's going to want to jump in here, but I just wanted to just say one quick thing in response to what you just said, Mary, and I, I, I could not agree more. We have to move away from these carve-outs. Yes, we have carve-outs in Ohio for compassionate release. If you, um, you know, been convicted of a, a murder or a sex offense, I mean, you, you can't, you can't get it. And, um, and when we think about a more comprehensive second look statute, no carve-outs. No carve-outs. I mean, I, I think if we accept carve-outs as the advocates pushing for change, we are throwing people under the bus and we are leaving people behind and we should not be leaving people behind. And so part of what we're trying to figure out how to do is to elevate the voices of folks like Norman, frankly, that are released that we've gotten out through Beyond Guilt and elevate their voices and show the community how they are just living good lives, they're your neighbors, and helping to humanize folk. Because if we can, if we can um, uh, humanize and help people understand that we're not talking about anything other than human beings here, then I think that will help us when it comes time for our big push for um, a second look statute with no car. Um, you talked about sort of how to navigate um, victims and, 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 and that narrative, as well as carve outs. But I'm wondering what other challenges uh, do you face um, when advocating for your clients? Or advocating for people in general who have been over. Well, um, in terms of our experience in Ohio, we've experienced um, a, a lot less resistance than we thought from prosecutors in the big counties, where we have experienced some problems are with prosecutors in the in the more rural counties that. Um, just are more resistant. So that's a that's a challenge. Um, you know, I, I'm anticipating that there will be challenges in our legislature um, in terms of the carve outs. I just and I know you brought that up as one of the things you're asking about others, but I I think that what we haven't experienced is a lot of pushback um, in the media. Uh, we've done a pretty good job of telling some success stories and getting very favorable coverage of the people that um, we are serving. So I think the, the, you know, what we really need here is to, is to get as many of the prosecutors in, in, in the state to be supportive of this concept. I think that will help us a lot when it comes time to going with the legislature. Uh, I, just as somebody who's who's thinking also about um, sort of large reform, not so much working on individual cases, although we've had good success with those, but I think right now the challenge that we're facing is a fair amount of skepticism and a lot of um, uh, pushback based on what are seen as escalating crime rates and violent crime rates and using those um, sort of anecdotal examples as a way of saying, if you, this is, this is the consequence of reducing a prison population. You're going to, you know, wreak havoc. And we saw it over and over again when at the federal level, 
um, those crack cocaine sentences were reduced and the sentencing commission decided to follow suit and actually make their lowered guideline changes retroactive. So a lot of people did get out. And the government came in and said, no, you can't, you know, you, you can't let everybody out. You have to exclude these people and so forth. And ha happily, the commission chose not to do it and left it up to the judges to determine whether or not there was somebody who, who really uh, didn't deserve to go home at that point or whose sentence shouldn't be reduced. But that's the big thing we're seeing now is I'm beginning to get a little nervous about some of the media around um, the, the rise in crime and gun, gun crime and things like that. And again, there's not a strict line. And I agree with you that telling stories of people who succeed is super important. You know, really talking about recidivism risks, you know, the, the cohort of, um, uh, mostly gentlemen who were released in Maryland behind a, a court case there, there were quite a lot of them who were released and their recidivism rate is vanishingly small. Um, so I think those are all important. Um, David, you mentioned the carve outs and, and you talked about um, that we're leaving people behind with people under the bus. But I guess I wonder, you know, throughout the criminal legal system, there's always, when there's opportunities for reform, I mean, there's almost always some sort of carve out. If you're looking at drug offenses, it's, you know, well, sure, but let's carve out fentanyl and heroin. If we're talking about um, uh, other types of reforms, it's, it's people with, um, sex uh, sex related convictions that that must be excluded and i'm wondering if, if anyone would like to elaborate on, on on david's earlier point of leaving people behind but well but what about the, all the other people that you can help is it really worth um throwing away an opportunity um to not exclude people if i understand your question i think what you're saying is we want to get the most people out. We want the opportunity for as many people as possible. And do we have to sometimes expect that the reform isn't, you know, isn't, isn't. Well, I guess, so my question, my question is, um, uh, it's to really build on David's earlier point of carve outs and why, why they aren't, um, necessarily the best thing and, and sort of the reality of if you don't, carve out, make carve outs and exclusions, that maybe then nothing happens. If, if I might, I, so yeah, I understand. Um, so I think part of it is the reason why a second look authority is, um, is fashioned is because we decide either as a, a community, a criminal justice community, that a particular sentence no longer fits. It doesn't meet the purposes of punishment, that we're no longer serving society's interests by keeping somebody incarcerated. Or we've determined that that individual has outlived the usefulness of their sentence by doing so well. I mean, there's a variety of reasons. Either we change or the people who are inside change, right? And that um, and that therefore we need to stop the incarceration. In, in the federal system, we have a, a sentencing standard, which is that the sentence should be sufficient, but no greater than necessary to meet the purposes of punishment. Well, once you stop meeting the purposes of punishment, the sentence, that person ought to be returned and restored to the community. Um, so making categorical exclusions doesn't um, admit to the humanity of the individual. It doesn't admit to their redemptive power that we all have in us. Um, some of us get caught for what we did and some of us don't, <laughs> or what we are accused of and some of us don't. But um, as a people, I think we we lose some of our own humanity if we cannot admit to the humanity of others and recognize that there's a moment when it is time to to restore them to us and us to them in some sense. that. Uh, and I, I just think it's essential to our, to the integrity of our criminal justice system that we recognize that. And I'll say one quick other thing, which is if you, if one wants to be concerned about, and I think a lot of these carve outs have to do with being afraid about people who will return and then perhaps be convicted again or reoffend. Um, trust your decision maker. Set up a system that is airtight, that requires the decision maker, whether it be a judge or a parole board or whoever it is, give them the tools and the power and then trust them to make the right the right decision because it is in that judgment. In the federal system, there are no exclusions and all kinds of people are getting compassionate release right now. But lots of people aren't. And sometimes just because of the nature of the offense, 
because of the nature of the conduct or because of the nature of what, how the individuals handle themselves. And sometimes it's just plain meanness. But all I'm saying is if we're going to set up a system, then let's give our, our decision makers guidance, sufficient guidance, and then real power and trust them to do their jobs. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Oh, was that Norman trying to get in? No, you can go ahead. No, brother, you go. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I can agree. I just wanted to add to the fact of what Murray was saying and, and Patrice came up with carve-outs. I think that if we, uh, uh, prison has become a warehouse. And, and in the process of becoming a warehouse, um, there's so many people going in. The budgets are being cut. They are not the, uh, the adequate amount of classes, the adequate amount of, of resources for people that have gone in to make improvements in their lives. Uh, there were a time in, uh, back in the day when you can go in, you can get pay up grants, you can further your education, you can pick up trades, you can do all kinds of things to go in one way and be ready to come out another way. But now due to the overcrowdedness and the lack of budget resources, now what is happening is that people are going in uh, and, and, and no incentives are set before them. So they're going in 18, 19, 20, and 22 years old, and they're just being warehoused. There are no incentives. So people are asked to just go in, sit around, watch TV, stay locked down. There's no development taking place. So if there's no development taking place, there's no incentives for development being taking place. That will cut down on a whole lot of violence inside of uh, prisons. It will it will give people incentives to want to improve so that they can come out to be a better person, so that they can be better in the community, add a lot of their gifts to society. Those are things that would help people uh, improve while they're in. But Patrice, that's not taking place in prison. If I could just say a couple things on that, I I think, um, you know, Norman's hitting on an important point that we need to um, really, truly invest in the rehabilitation of folks. Um, you know, fortunately, the people that we've been able to represent so far through our project, ha and it's unfortunate they've had to do this, they've had to find ways on their own to... Uh, get the programming. Sometimes that is like paying for you know, various correspondence pro, uh, uh, courses. Um, it, it's it's taking advantage of every little thing, and I think our prison system should do more. But they 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 really have taken advantage of of, of all that is offered, even if it's meager, and then they've supplemented it um, to, in order to, to build their records of of, of rehabilitation and redemption and it shouldn't have to be that hard i agree with norman i think there should be um more robust programming overall and for those people who are finding ways nonetheless to improve and are you know been in a significant sentence let's get them out let's not keep them in a moment um beyond that point where they've paid their debt back and can safely be I totally agree. I mean, I think that um, the first day somebody um, walks in, release planning should start on day one, right? Um, and we're going to lock people up. And I really think that we should minimize as much more than we have. We have to avoid incarceration if possible. And, and, and only if necessary, we need to make sure that the sentence is fashioned that addresses you know, conduct and characteristic and history and needs and so forth. But we've also got to transform our prison cultures um, into, you know, investing and in ensuring the success of returning individuals to the community. Um, you want, we have literally a captive audience, right? Um, you want to use the time that people are there to provide them with wraparound supports, release planning, job training, education, uh, medical and mental health care, um, you know, uh, therapies, drug treatment, life coaching, give people meaningful work. And then when they're preparing to, and keeping families connected, which is a huge issue. Um, here in DC, people are sent hundreds of thousands of miles away sometimes to serve their time. We don't even, we don't have a 
present here. But then once people are ready to go, make sure that they have a soft landing, make sure that people have government IDs, right? Um, that they've applied for public assistance if they've needed it. So it starts when they leave and they don't have to wait for weeks for something to happen. Make sure housing is in place. I mean, we should be ensuring that people have a soft and supportive landing. And if we don't want to do it because it's a humane thing or the right thing or the in thing to do, do it because we want to ensure that we're safe as a community as well. I'm wondering, um, if, if David, and, and definitely for the rest of the panelists, can you share a little bit how in Ohio you are able to get people out? Maybe share the sort of the mechanics of the Beyond Guild. What what is the legal? What are the legal mechanisms? That allow yeah, that's really funny. The legal mechanisms. Um, uh, it's magic. Uh, no, it's it's, it's really. Um, it, it, it's really workarounds that we're using right now because we don't. Um, you know, we do have uh, the ability for people to get judiciary, judicially released, but that's not going to apply um, to folks serving life sentences. And so in in the cases that we've had success in so far, we have been able to tell very um, persuasive stories of transformation and redemption to the prosecutor's office. and. They've gone to us with, you know, gone to us, um, gone with us to meet the judge, basically to say, Singleton's going to file this motion for a new trial on behalf of this person. Now, judge, we're not going to object to it at all. And of course, I don't, I'm not, my client's not meeting the, 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 the technical requirements of newly discovered evidence of actual innocence in order to, to get released. And the judge is going with it because the judge wants to solve the problem, doesn't want to have the person over incarcerated, and um, the prosecutor is not going to appeal. So that's a workaround. Um, we've been able to do that um, in a number of cases. And I'm not, and we do not have what we would consider here or in, in the country to be progressive prosecutors. Uh, Patrice, I know you know um, about Joe Dieters, who we've done a lot of uh, these this work with, and he is the opposite of a progressive prosecutor, but yet he um, has has cared about uh, the overpunishment of people, and so that is how we've done it um, in cases where the person um, pled guilty to murder or to some other serious crime. We've 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 uh, filed motions to withdraw guilty pleas with the same um, workaround because that that standard. To withdraw a guilty plea after sentence is very high, and if we were fought hard on that, we would not be able to prevail, but we've been effective so far in telling those stories of transformation and redemption and getting um, prosecutors to be supportive. So that's the, what we've been doing in Ohio. It's been you know working around the absence of a second look provision for people who are serving life sentences. Oh, I should also say, and, and, and we and we also do represent people who come before the parole board. That's a whole nother awful conversation we could have about how um, bad our system is here in Ohio. But that's not unique. That's uh, across the country. Uh, we do that work, too. But uh, the work I'm most excited about, frankly, is trying to, to build these relationships with prosecutors and get more of them to be supportive of this concept of we need um, a second look statute for people convicted of life offenses. You brought up um, parole, which is sort of a hobby horse of mine. So I'm going to ask the panelists. Um, uh, so you're talking about getting people out of prison. Why isn't the answer just, all right, fine, we'll just put everybody on parole? Um, if you're serving a life sentence, what's wrong with lifetime parole? Is that a is that a solution? Ooh. It's better than prison, right? Norman, did I see? Did I hear you getting ready to say something? No, I was just taking a deep breath. Is that because well, you had a reaction to the, to the question? I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. 
<laughs> you said, how about life? How about uh, lifetime parole? If you're serving a life well, sentence, life I'm wondering if that's a solution. Well, um, I think that it would, I would, I would choose, I would choose to be uh, at, at all costs free uh, on in, in society and having to report to someone uh, for the remaining of my life than to spend the remaining of my life incarcerated where I have limited choices and limited opportunities. Uh, yes, uh, but, but going back to the parole, I was not, a, I was not on parole because parole had, um, had ceased in the District of Columbia at that time. But I saw a lot of people who were under parole and that were going up and, um, and for, for several apparent reasons and for a lot of reasons, uh, parole was back doing them to almost uh, back to making them do 85% of their time. And I'm meaning people who had programmed well and did all the things that they were supposed to do, but for some odd reason, they were coming back because the new law was 85% and majority of the states that are here in America, it seems like people were coming back that were under old law before the 85% came into effect. And the parole boards were, 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 were making them do 85% of their times. It's one thing if you're inside and you're incarcerated and you're continually getting in trouble uh, violating your own uh, parole and not doing the things that you are supposed to do. But there's another thing when you are doing what you're supposed to do and you go up for parole, you get your GED, you get your high school diploma, you get several degrees, you're not getting any infractions, and then you go up and a parole board continuously keeps hitting you with two and three year hits. That is driving people insane in prison. And the parole board, uh, I think, what has ended up happening, Patrice and, uh, and panelists, is that I think the, the members on the parole boards, their mindsets are outdated. They're on there too long. And I think parole boards, for those that are still active, need to get some fresh blood in there with some fresh ideas so they can give up some fresh justice. I will jump in just, and I know I'm the moderator, uh, you know, I'm in Illinois. Illinois does not have traditional parole. It was abolished in 1968. And so there are some people who were sentenced pre-1968 who are, who are eligible for parole, but at this point there's something like 20 people. Um, what's interesting though is we have mandatory supervised release and the largest group of people that are entering our Department of Corrections are people who are on supervision and are going back for technical violations. Um, so that's why I was asking the question about parole, because I think we are seeing across the country that um, a driver of our prison population uh, are people who are being violated, who are either on some form of, who are on some form of supervision. So I'm wondering, you know, as we look, as we are looking to decarcerate our, our, prisons, the actual facilities, um, are we setting people up if we just put them on some sort of supervision? And I guess the related question to that is what happens to our communities when we have significant number of people who are in community and on supervision? You all have any thoughts? I'll say a little bit about this, although I'm not an expert on supervised release and certainly not on parole, because as Norman points out, we got rid of parole in the D.C. and in the federal system a long time ago. Um, but on the supervised release front, I mean, one of the things that strikes me is that from a reform perspective, at least, well, and also from an advocacy on the individual perspective, I think one thing is to the extent that advocates in the courtroom can be looking at conditions of supervised release and trying to alter those to make sure that they're appropriate for the individual. I mean, sometimes there are standard conditions that have to be imposed, um, but lots of times there are additional, you know, uh, 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 conditions that are placed on individuals. And I think that there's a role for advocates in the courtroom on that. And there's also a role for those of us who are thinking about reform in a larger sense. How do we make sure that these supervised release are supportive systems and not punitive systems. Um, and I know in the our Compassionate Release Clearinghouse work, 
Um, we really encourage our volunteer lawyers to struggle with the judge and struggle with the government over additional terms of supervised release. Because what happens in the system is that if you release somebody early from prison, uh, if you're a judge and you reduce their sentence, you can take the remaining portion of that sentence and transforming it into <laughs> supervised release. And then adding additional terms such as ankle monitoring and you know, home confinement for some time for, for many years. And so we're really trying to educate and, and uh, educate the bar and also educate the judiciary that this is not necessary. And one of, actually, some of the people who have been helpful for us um, have been probation officers who have to supervise people, particularly in the moment, time of COVID, because they don't want to go to somebody's house and put on an ankle monitor. Um, they don't want to have to have somebody coming and visit them every month or so. So um, I think one of the things we can do is, um, as David's been doing in terms of making some common conversation with people that we usually fight with, like DAs and so forth, um, we might want to be thinking also about working with uh, people who do supervision. Now, parole boards is a different matter, and I've done a little work in that area, but just enough to know that I don't want to touch it because I think parole boards are a mess, and I get rid of the whole thing. But in terms of people that we can work with and um, and perhaps find some common ground with, I would think about probation officers. At least that's our experience in the federal system. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with um, with uh, what both Norman and, 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 and Mary, Mary have said. Um, I, I know that, I mean, your question is, is different, Patrice, than what our the people I represent would want if they if they could get out on parole, they would be delighted. the The problem is is that you you know par par parole and, and 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 to be honest, in Ohio, we do have a problem that has gotten a little bit better over the years in terms of the prison system being very reluctant to grab people back. Um, um, for technical violations. It's still a problem. Uh, there's still too many people back in prison for technical violations. But we've had good directors of our prison system who have been really pushing hard to decarcerate and have encouraged the adult parole authority here to bend over backwards to keep people in the community uh, unless there's a real reason to think that they are... Um, going to be dangerous. Um, so you get a number of opportunities to, 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 to mess up um, for, the, for the most part. Um, th the other thing that is, if you're serving a life sentence um, in Ohio and you get released on parole, your parole will be capped at five years. Now, let me be clear, that those five years are not, are, are, are not walks in the park. Um, you've got to get permission to travel. Um, you, you live with this, this fear that you're at the mercy and whim of someone who could yank away your freedom. Um, and whether or not that's going to happen, it's still that fear is there. So it does have an impact on, 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 on people who are being supervised and, I, I wish that we could, and, and Mary said this, and I just want to second it. I, I wish that we could move towards a system um, more focused on how do we make sure that people we are are, are getting released or who are getting released have the support that they need. Jessica Yount um, wrote a, a, a chat comment making that point that we need to focus on on what people need, and I, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, um, and and it would be a, a real shift if we could if, if parole supervision folks were more um, in the mold of social workers who could really help root people back into the community if, if they needed the assistance, rather than being viewed as this punitive force that's going to take away your freedom. I have a feeling that there'd be far greater compliance with conditions if it was more um, in a cooperative vein rather than this punitive vein. I could be wrong about that, but that's... Uh, 
have one more question and then we're going to check out the questions in the chat that from our audience so panelists um make sure you uh, look at the questions um so in this effort, uh, we did lose Norman, but it looks like he's back. So I'll give, just give one second so I'll make sure that Norman can hear the question. Oh, and we lost him. Okay. Um, so in this effort uh, to de decarcerate our, our prisons, um, we know traditionally the role of the prosecutors and judges. Um, we talked about um, victims and families. But I'm wondering, what about uh, corporations, businesses? philanthropy um, and other organizations that are not typically aligned with decarceration efforts, what role do you think that they can play? We saw a lot over the summer um, of, of organizations taking coming out, taking a stand for racial justice in our criminal legal system. Uh, how, what more, can, what more might they do? Or what other opportunities? And we just got Norman back. Norman, did you hear my question? No, I didn't. So um, I was asking uh, what role uh, can corporations, philanthropy and other organizations that are not typically aligned with um, decarceration efforts uh, play in this, in this uh, time for any of the panelists? Oh, I, I think that um, I think that our corporations that would like to get would like to get involved should um, should first thing I would would suggest them to do is number one is to have no problem with uh, giving people a second chance uh, when they come out if we can start there uh, because the conversation before this was uh, was talking about parole and, and technical violations. And, and one of the biggest technical violations that I have experienced a, a lot of people uh, receive is not being able to be employed. So if, if there's a big, if there's big corporations who uh, would be willing to give uh, people like myself a second chance uh, to prove to themselves and to prove to society that we are willing to work, we do have gifts that we can add to corporations we do have skills that we would like to uh to be able to uh to share with the community again then corporations should should uh should invest in um should invest in that they should invest in to uh organizations that are working directly uh with returning citizens and those that are coming home and uh and, and grants that will be allowing them to be able to further their education or their workforce development. Uh, organize, uh, uh, big organizations should be willing to do that because it's needed. And if, and if those type of things were to take place, you would, see a, you would see a drastic fall or a drastic drop in the crime rate. Because a lot of people that I talk to in the circles uh, that I spend a lot of time in, which are people that are coming home, a lot of times people are doing things from youth up to adults is because they are trying to get some money. So if we can get them employed and get them to understand that some of the things that you want, people believe in you, we're giving you a second chance. I'm a big preacher on that when it comes down to being a pathfinder for those that are coming home. Give us a chance, open up the doors, allow us to prove ourselves and let us move on and enjoy the rest of our lives being productive citizens. So that's one way that I would like to see corporations deal with uh, depopulating our prisons. I love that, Norman. Um, I would add one other thing about sort of organizations that are not typically in this space. I think they should use their bully pulpits. They should use their particular expertise to speak out. And we've seen some of this recently. I'm, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, the National Academies of Sciences just put out a report about decarcerating prisons in the age of COVID, looking at it as a public health crisis, the, which obviously it is. But I mean, it was this remarkable report. And, um, uh, you know, from, you know, I, I don't think I've ever read the National Academies of Science 
report. Um, the American Public Health Association just put out a report on the public health crisis. Racism is a public health crisis. That's what they called it. Um, another just a remarkable report. The American Medical Association's trustees just sent a resolution to the entire American Medical Association calling on all states to get together with stakeholders like all of us and figure out how to improve compassionate release uh, for people who are facing end of life or serious illnesses. So I'm delighted actually that those you know, organizations that I wouldn't normally come across in my day to day work are standing up and speaking out. And it just gives, it just puts, you know, kind of um, wind under our wings, right? I mean, we can, I can pull that out now and say, look what the American Public Health Association is saying. And this is what it means for people who are incarcerated. I just, I love that. And philanthropy, of course, <laughs> we all need money. So, but there's also just really smart philanthropy going on as well with engaged, smart people. Um, not just in traditional um, funding agencies, but also in in tech and other areas that are beginning to notice the work that uh, that uh, that's going on. So, uh, have you all had an opportunity to look at the questions? I'll, I will uh, read the first one just in case. Um, so. Uh, we have a question going back to uh, resentencing statutes, and we, we hit on carve-outs. And the question is, is whether, um, an another concern is about whether the sole power to move for resentencing is vested in the prosecutor, uh, yet that often seems, the, seems to be the only way that a second look bill will pass the state legislature. Do you, do you all favor that all or nothing approach or settling for a bill that gives prosecutor, the prosecutor alone the power to prove a sentencing? So, Patrice, you know me well enough to know that if I was really answering that in my unfiltered way, I'd be, I would say, hell, and then be something in the middle, no. Um, no, I don't think that the prosecutor should be the only one that can seek. Um, uh, relief under a second look statute. And, the, you know, what we're hoping to get done in Ohio is one that, um, that, that allows, um, the incarcerated person to seek it, that allows, um, the, the Department of Rehabilitation and Correction to seek it. Because frankly, you know, the conversations I have with the, with the, uh, leadership of, of our system, they know who is, you know, ready to come home. And often it's the people who've been there and just being warehoused and they've seen them grow. Um, and then, of course, yeah, prosecutors. I'd love to have prosecutors uh, be able to seek it, too, but they should not be the only voices that seek it. Um, it the question, you know, also raises the question of is if that's what you can get. Do you live with it? Well, I mean, I think what we do is we push for as broad a bill as we can get and hopefully we get it and you know if we don't then we we work with what we have and we work then to to, to broaden it um but uh I, I would hope that we would have a bill with no carve outs and with um some you know with with other interested parties being able to seek uh to seek uh, relief under Sounds like something that's going on in New York right now, Steve. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I think we get what we can get. We push for the most we can get. We never get everything we want. Um, I mean, I just know for years of toiling and compassionate release where um, the reason it had to be changed in the federal system was because of who controlled access to compassionate release, and that was the Bureau of Prisons, right? So this was an agency whose job it was to keep people locked up, and there was also the agency whose the only way one could get into court was via a motion from the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And you can imagine that it didn't happen, right? There were a handful of cases every year um, until Congress got fed up with the situation. So I, it's a real tension, though, because, you know, if you can get something and begin to change the culture, you know, you know we're beginning to see conversations about sentencing integrity units behind behind work that's been done with conviction integrity units. And I, and I really applaud conviction integrity, but it doesn't get to all the people who were prosecuted for something they 
did, right? I mean, or that we can't prove that they didn't do it, right? So I feel like those sentence integrity units are so much more important. So just beginning to use muscles, teaching prosecutors and others to use muscles that they didn't even know they had to do, to do good in ways that they couldn't have imagined themselves doing. I mean, we have to start small, um, but I don't think we ever stop pushing for what is the right thing to do. Thank you. We have um, Christopher asked about a, a Supreme Court case that was argued on November 3rd, Jones versus Mississippi. Are, are any of you familiar with that court case and able to speak on it? I read about that briefly and, and, and I'm trying to remember exactly what that was about. Um, it may come to me in a Um, and I'm looking over at the chat as our time is winding down. Um, Jessica asked Mary about the report you um, mentioned from the National the Science Group. Are you able to, if you have a link, are you able to drop it in the chat or maybe just the title and Jessica can find it via Google? Um, there was also a question uh, about can restorative justice programs be implemented in federal courts regarding drug distribution and machine gun offenses? And maybe, Mary, that's for you since you work on the federal side. But David, also, and Norman, um, if you have thoughts. And sorry, Mary, I know you were also looking for that. It's okay. I just missed the question, though. Um, forgive me. Um... Restorative justice program be implemented in federal courts regarding drug distribution and machine gun offenses. Um, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's a. It's a really interesting question, Ariana. Um, I think that I don't know if you're talking about sort of gun offenses where individuals get these like very very long sentences because they have been using drugs or distributing drugs and are also convicted of possessing a weapon in connection with that. They were very, very long sentences that are um, they're imposed in those cases or were until the First Step Act, which shortened somewhat the, the sentences. I will tell you that people who are convicted under what they call the 924C um, mandatory minimums, which used to call for a five-year consecutive mandatory minimum sentence for use of a gun or possession of a gun, and then 25 years consecutive stacked one on top of the other. If one was convicted within a within a within one proceeding, those were those individuals who receive those sentences are overwhelmingly black. Some like seventy percent of people who receive those stacked sentences. So I mean we've fixed the problem prospectively, but we have to now go back and fix the problem retroactively. And this is one of the big dangers of fixing a problem and then leaving people behind to continue serving sentences we use their stories to make change and then we leave, <laughs> we leave them uh, behind. So we can't do that. And forgive me, Jess, or, or, or Ariana, if that's not your question, you can reach out to me separately because I think you know how to reach me and I'll try and find that other uh, report and put it in the chat now. We are actually at time, um, but maybe as I'm closing out, Mary, you can drop it in the chat, um, but thank you to all of the panelists, Norman, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your expertise and wisdom. Mary, thank you so much for also sharing. And David, as always, complete gratitude for everything. Um, uh, and thank you to uh, the uh, attendees. I hope that um, they, they were inspiring to you and, and, and gave you ideas for, your for uh, implementing this work maybe in your jurisdiction. Um, thank you so much for joining us and please have a great evening.